get your um, life advice from? My mom. Uh, my wife. My brothers. Basically, pretty close family. There's six kids, and uh, we talk a lot, like yeah. every night. Her. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever gotten? If you're not 100% sure about something, then wait. Do what your heart says. Yeah. Enjoy what you do. Life is valuable. You know, you only get one life, so live it how you can. And try to find the good in it. You know, there's a lot of negative in life, but if you can find the positive, I feel like that can make you a stronger person. Yeah. All right, okay, why do you think people want to become better people? I think there's an, uh, something inherent in people that makes you want to do good and be better to your fellow human. And I think that is true for most people. Probably to feel better and to like give back to other people maybe. I mean, that's why I would want to. Uh, as a human race, we always strive to better ourselves. No. No, you don't. I, I think... How do I say this? I, I think some do and some don't, and, and I don't know that it's anyone's fault that they don't. It's just they they don't know a different way, and mm -hmm. uh, it, those are the ones you try to reach and help and bring them up. I think. All right, so we find ourselves right in the heart of the Gospel of John, struggling and wrestling through the idea of infinite and intimate. This Almighty God who created all things, who also loves Leland and knows him and has a purpose for him, right? We are in the middle of this series where we are talking about an infinite God who is intimately involved in his life. Before we dive into the word, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, thank you, first of all, for Leland and for his parents, for the opportunity to baptize a child into the church of Jesus Christ, knowing that, Lord, our desire is that one day he will come back and he will profess his faith in you, Lord, that he has been, uh, that he will have been faithfully called and, and you will seek after him all the days of his life and that he will answer that call. In the same way also for us, God, as your church, we gather to attend well to the word that you have given us in scripture and we ask, Lord, would you speak? Would you strike anything from it that's not of you? And would you help your word come alive and move among us? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So how does God guide us? How does this infinite God of the universe guide us on the intimate paths we lead in life? And what does scripture say about God, his plan, and the way he guides us? I think it's important to recognize God does guide us. God does direct our paths. He doesn't force us down a path. He invites us down a path. And one of the things that we have to understand is guidance is not something we accept well. We're not usually really good at that, but one of the things that God did is he gave us some tools to understand what God's guidance looks like. Here's the way I kind of say it, and then I'm going to unpack something here. Jesus in John 15 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. We could just stop right there and go, wait, what? What's a vine dresser? What does that have to do with anything? Let me ask you this. Has anybody here ever been to Napa in California wine country? A few of us. Isn't it glorious? It's so beautiful. Okay, if you didn't make it to Napa, anybody here been to like Leelanau up in Traverse City? Yeah. If you haven't made it up there, anybody made it to Finville? <laughs> well, it's the closest, right? I mean, we're just slowly. No, I'm joking. I, I'm sure the wine's great. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Boy, I took a detour quick. Um, so when you come to a vineyard, what you understand is they're in these beautiful kind of perfect rows, aren't they? There's these trellises that are built, and on the trellises grow the grapevines, and, and, and they just kind of fill up, and as you drive by, it's almost hypnotic just to watch those, those vine lines as you go by, right? It's beautiful, and they're all laid out in a row, and it's really good, but what we often don't understand is Jesus in an agrarian culture. This was an agriculture-based society back when Jesus lived in it. He gave an image that all of his people would understand, but none of us really do. We don't understand what it's like to live hand-to-mouth. And when I say hand-to-mouth, to grow some food and then to eat it. 
that's generally not our practice. Somebody grows food, we buy a box of Cheez-Its and call it all square, don't we? That's how our, oh, call it all square. That kind of work because Cheez-Its. All right, so um, we not, we're not used to that, but Jesus uses an image that we maybe should understand, a vine dresser someone who works the vineyards. A vine dresser is someone who prunes the grapevines daily. They walk the rows of grapevines with a pruning knife and they prune the vines. They absolutely do work that is tedious, it's detailed, and they know the vines. They walk through and they can tell you the strange idiosyncrasies of every row of grapes and every vine that puts forth the fruit. They do this for the cultivation of good grapevines, because good grapevines produce good grapes. You see, they work with a vision in mind, and they work year-round to ensure production. Production. Even when it's not pretty, when there's no beautiful clusters of grapes hanging off the leaves, they are watching and knowing what needs to happen in order that the vines are abundantly fruitful. When we talk about being fruitful, in the ancient world, it means you eat. In our world, there's not a really good comparison. Fruitful in the life of a Christian means that we should be growing out of us something that is life-giving and good to the world around us. And there is a vine dresser in our life. And the direction the vine dresser takes is one of constant attention, daily attending to the needs of the vineyard and cutting off that which is dead, failing to produce good fruit, or getting in the way of growing good things. The trellises, those things that are the wires and they're the big posts that they stick in the ground and then they run the wires out. The trellises, those are important and the vine dressers attend to those in the off season so that when the grape vine does begin to give forth its shoots, it is ready to withstand the load of the harvest before it's taken. It is ready to hold the growth that comes. The trellises are vital and it is a way that the vine dresser uses to guide the vine. Vines, naturally, if you've ever had a big tree and some vines get around it and they start growing up it, vines naturally crawl up things to get to the sun. And grapes, when they grow wild, grow in all directions. But when you go by a vineyard, a vine dresser, if you looked down and saw a big bush in the middle of a vineyard, that would be a failure of the vine dresser because the vine dresser is supposed to take those little green shoots, the little green shoots, and they are supposed to take And is that me? Okay. No, you're good. Don't be sorry. I didn't mean to point you out. Um, They take these. um, They they take these little shoots and they cut them. And then the the good ones they wrap around a string so that it'll grow out along the line and the trellis will fill fill up. It won't grow wild. It'll fill up and grow down. The vine dresser has a job that says this: There's no growth yet, but I know where you're going to grow and I know what I want you to grow. That's why Jesus used this imagery. That's why Jesus said, I am the vine. I am the source of life. I am rooted deep in the soil, but my father is the vine dresser. John chapter 15, one to eight is your homework this week. I want you to attend to this scripture. I want you to read it through a number of times and gain trust that there is a vine dresser who knows that maybe there's no growth in your life yet, but he knows where he wants you to grow and he's gonna help you get there if you will trust him and stay connected. We need to understand the heart of the vine dresser. And the way we do that is turn ourselves towards a small text. And this comes out of the message translation, and it really is quite simple. It says, make yourself at home in me and my words at home in you. John chapter 15, verse 9. Make yourself at home in me and my words at home at you in you. Have you ever been somewhere where you um, feel at home, like completely at ease? Sometimes home can be a little chaotic. I know for us it is at times, for Erica and I. And we go to this place. Her parents built a place up north um, back in the late 70s, and uh, it's this little cottage. It is not fancy. I think it still has, I know it does, it still has the awesome like 70s paneling on the wall and stuff. It is legit. I love it. There's four bedrooms. We will pack 
oh, 13 or 14 of us in there. There's one bathroom, there's a line, it's awkward, and you're just like lining up to get through. But the reality that I always find fascinating is we all <sighs> take a breath when we're up there and just relax. You get up in the morning and somebody's either made coffee or the coffee pot's continually going. You can sit out on the deck and watch the mist kind of burn off under the sunlight and do your devotions and just be quiet. You're not there to impress anyone or do anything. You hopefully later in the day will get out on the raft and attack your children with great veracity to prove to them that you are still the alpha male of the family. You will get towed behind a boat until your teeth chip on the tube. You will have fun and you won't comb your hair for five days. You're not putting on airs. And one of the things I love is my wife puts her hair in a ponytail and that's just about it. It's just plain ordinary us. And we're at home and you kind of sink in there. And it feels really good to be there. I get rotten cell service, so why even bring it? And you just get to be there. You just get to be present. You get to make yourself at home in a place that's peaceful and joyful and wonderful. You just kind of rest in. That's what Jesus is talking about. He says, make yourself at home in me. Make yourself at home in me. Make my words at home in you. Get my words into your life. Let them live inside of you. And when we do this, it really has two effects on us. The first thing is we begin to feel safe when we're following our guide. And we're going to use guide in two different kind of metaphors here. One of them is the vine and the vine dresser, and the other is kind of a Bear grills guide. There's two different ways that we're going to play with the idea of how God guides us. But one of the ways that we know that when we make ourselves at home in Jesus Christ and his word at home in our lives is we begin to feel safe because we know someone has our best interest at heart. Did anybody here when you were little ever feel afraid at night when you're in your room? I did. I was perpetually afraid of things. It could be that my older brother terrorized me, but that's for a different therapist. Um, <laughs> All right, um, but you know, you, I was afraid as a kid, and I would lay there, and I would try not to get nervous, I'd try not to panic and call out for my dad and do that stuff, but I would, there was times where I'd lay there, I'm like, it's fine, dad's here, it's fine, your dad's here, stop being crazy, you're okay, and I would talk to myself because I was afraid, I was very frightened as a little boy, and for me, I would remind myself that there was someone in the building who had my best interest at heart, and I felt safe in that. I felt like, well, like the words of Jeremiah 29, 11 really are true. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to bless you and to prosper to you, to give you hope and a future. And the only way we can live into the blessing and the hope of God is to stay connected to him because we begin to feel safe when we make ourselves at home in Christ because he has proven by his life, death, and resurrection that he is a safe place. We begin to feel safe. The second thing we feel is free. We begin to feel free in the life we're living. And this is, um, this is really kind of fun to me because freedom, a lot of people think freedom is like those grapevines just growing wild. Let's all go this way and you just take off. No, what's freedom? True freedom is knowing your boundaries and playing within them. We are not talking about conforming to rules which produce this drudgery and kind of angry, kind of like, you know, chafing. It just rubs us the wrong way. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about obedience that produces and fuels freedom. The ability to follow Jesus Christ into mission, into the wild adventure that he's called us to. So there's this uh, little quote I want to read you. Obedience... Uh, but the obedience Jesus is talking about is an obedience not to societal rules, but to the Father, who is all love. To obey him is to conform one's life to the very pattern of God's life. You begin to live with an infinitely broad scope of God's power coming to rest on your life. You begin to participate and you feel free and safe to fully live. And I will tell you this, one of the great crises of this generation is if you ask teenagers, do you feel free and safe? They're like, no, because anything you do online, if you make a mistake in a so social setting, it can blow up on Instagram now. 
And so we have a crisis of people who, of young people who will not respond to someone in danger because they don't want to look foolish instantly to the world. They don't feel free and they don't feel safe. In Christ, we recognize that when we make ourselves at home in Jesus and we make his word at home in us, we begin to feel safe and we begin to feel free, free to be whom he has called us. But the problem is we're not really good at following a guide. We want to feel safe and free, but we don't want to follow in a faithful obedience. But we are called, as Eugene Peterson said, to a long obedience in the same direction, to follow Jesus Christ in mission and purpose. Think of it this way. Anybody here ever watch Bear Grylls, the awesome British man who eats weird things all the time? Few of us have. He is an adventurer. He's a Brit, and he's awesome. Let's just imagine we go to the Amazon on an Amazonian river trek. Yes, that's the word. Amazonian river trek. And you're getting ready to go. And you get all the cool Bear Grylls stuff. You got the Bear Grylls knife, the Bear Grylls poncho, you know, all the good stuff. You're ready to go. You're at the hotel. The next morning, you're leaving in four dugout canoes. And you're going to go down the Amazon, clear to Iquitos, and you're going to find your way through. You're going to live off the land. And how legit is that going to be? So you get up that morning, Bear Grylls knife, in the sheath, you crawl in your dugout canoe, and off you go. You know? Just, oh, this is great. But you leave Bear at the hotel, because really, you've got the stuff you need. Your knife says, BG, you should be good to go, right? You are Bear Grylls. (laughs) Three days later, they find you in an anaconda. (laughs) Why? Why would you end up there? Because you didn't realize the value of the guide. You didn't realize that staying connected to the guide is not just for your safety, but how many of us have said, God, I feel no purpose in this life. I don't know what I'm here for. And I feel like my life is just growing off in some direction, and I don't know what to do. We don't feel like we have a guide, and it's because we have left him for our own desires. And the reality is, the only way that we are going to get through this life is to, going back to the metaphor of the, of, of the Amazon trek, is to stay connected to the guide who not only knows how not to get eaten by an anaconda, which I believe is very important. End on my story of snakes. Well, but he, they know how not to die, according to snakes or spiders, right? They know what's safe to eat and not to eat. You have a good guide. But they also know where you're supposed to go. They don't start off on an adventure going, well, I wonder where this will end up. You know what they call those? People who don't come back. We have a guide who knows where we're supposed to go. Remember the vine dresser? You may not see the vines spread out on the lines, but before the vines ever grow, they do. They know where they want it to go. God knows the end from the beginning. He has a goal for your life, and he's calling us to stay connected to the guide. So if we stay connected, here's one of the cool things our life begins to produce fruit. If we're connected to the vine, our life begins to have an abundance to it that maybe is unique to our life. So the fruit of the vine. The fruit of the vine is a fascinating thing because the fruit of the Spirit of Christ living in us is love for the Father. Let's just look real quick. The Apostle Paul says that there are fruits, things that grow out of our lives. Have you ever pictured yourself like the fruit of the loom people? Just standing there, a big apple. That's what we're talking about. You should be growing things of God out of your life. And it should be visible on you like apples are on a tree. You should be producing these things if you are in the life of Christ. And the first thing we are going to see is what the Apostle Paul talked about in Galatians. The fruits of the Spirit are start with love. Love. You will have a strange love for your heavenly father because in feeling safe and in feeling free to live and in feeling close because Christ is right inside your life, you begin to grow a love. And it's not yours to, to foster or grow. It simply becomes when we are connected to the vine. So Jesus Christ loved the heavenly father. Do you notice that in scripture through the gospels? Jesus loved his heavenly father. 
He talks about him all the time. Listen to how he talks about him in John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes back so that it will become even more fruitful. You, his disciples, are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. One of the fruits we grow first is a love for God, our Father, because we recognize not only is our eternity safe, but our present is purposeful. And we begin to love him for what he's done and the life he's called us into. We begin to love the Heavenly Father. So here's the thing that I think is really important when we talk about love for the Father. It's not dormant. That's not just the end goal. We actually grow this other thing, which is you love God the Father, and then through that connection, we grow a love that goes from us out to this world. And I am not talking about the kind of love you see, like, you know, if you're old enough like me to remember the movie Ghost with Demi Moore, one awesome crystalline tear down her cheek making pottery. Like, you know, oh, it's so beautiful. It's love, right? No, I'm talking William Wallace love. The kind that says I am no longer willing to see the people around me live subjugated to an evil rule. I will fight and I will give my life for this cause. The kind of love that has teeth to it. Love that comes from us to the world around us. It is shamelessly open and outwards for others and we recognize that there is a difference when we love the world as God does and when we pity the world as we often do. What I recognize is if you just serve other people apart from loving God, that's pity, and it's nice, and it's charitable, but it is not love from your heavenly Father. Love from your heavenly Father only comes by being connected to the vine because you first have love for your heavenly Father. You must be connected to the guide and to the source of life that will produce in you a love for other people that becomes a harvest of righteousness around you. Your life begins to tell his story. So there's another fruit that comes. As Paul said, the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy. Love and joy. And the second thing, when we look at joy, we have to understand that if we have no joy in our obedience, something is wrong. Have you ever seen somebody do the, wrong, do the right thing with the wrong attitude? Anybody ever seen that? Tell your kids, could you clean up your room? Fine. That's what I'm talking about. Like, why is your chin out so far? Why are you so angry at me? I don't live in your pigsty, right? You know, you, you kind of go, yeah, they do it, but they're angry. Have you ever seen your parents do something for you, young people? And they're like, no, it's fine. I'll mow the lawn. Pay all the bills. Mow the lawn, son. And then you're out there mowing the lawn, kind of crazy, wild-eyed. May have happened at my house recently, <laughs> right? You know, you're doing the right thing. Oh, I'll get it done. You just go ahead and rest. <laughs> right? There's, the heart is absolutely absent. Actually, the heart's not absent. Your darkness is very present, manifesting itself. You're so mad, and you're hoping a toad jumps out. <laughs> you know, it's just, there's a darkness that comes over us. We do the right things with the wrong heart. There should be a joy in the way the people of God obey their Heavenly Father. It is not drudgery or just duty it is the joyful obedience of the saints that people go, why are you so happy doing that? Why are you so happy following him? Right action with the wrong heart does not equalize. We have to be people who are joyful in our obedience. The fruit of the Spirit is love for our Heavenly Father and then from our Heavenly Father in our life that produces the next fruit, which is joy, a joyful obedience to do the unlikely to participate with God in his redemptive purposes for this world. And I will tell you this, there is no life apart from being connected to the vine, the thing that is taprooted, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is also no life if we don't allow God to prune back that which is in our life and isn't fruitful. There are things you're doing now that need to stop in order that your life can become an abundant harvest for the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God could come through you. It's a joyful obedience, not drudgery. So let's apply this in a few ways here. First of all, I want to invite you to check for fruit, right? Just look for it. We've named two. 
love, and joy. Struggle with those at all like I do. This has not been my most joyful week. I'm going to just be very honest, and you can continue to be disappointed in me. Um, I've really struggled with not happiness. Anybody can slap a smile on me, (laughs) you know, but not that. I have really struggled with loving people this week. I didn't like them. Like, I didn't like a lot of people. Like, there was a point at which, and of course, where does it happen for me? Four-way stops. (laughs) Like, I should just avoid them. But I'm driving, and there's people who decide to love one another by waving. And I'm like, drive, drive. What is wrong with you people? And I start, I'm talking to them, and I'm getting mad. My voice is dropping. And, um, and my wife is next to me. And I think she was looking at me like, what is wrong? My kids are in the back, like, <laughs> like laughing. And I'm like, you know what? If I had a smite button, just poof, done. Drive through. People need to learn how to get things straight. This is not what the Lord loves. It's a four-way stop, not a four-way wave. Get on with it. I, and, and you think like, oh, he's being, fun. I'm not. I was not kind and would have pushed the smite button. And then I wouldn't have stopped. I would have just driven through because there was nobody left. That would have been my choice. I, and I'm, I'm joking, but I'm serious. Like, it manifests itself as the counter of love. It was pride. You know what those people needed? They needed Eric Folkers behind the wheel to teach them how to drive and how to live correctly. And there's about a dozen other ways where I have disappointed not only myself, but I think my wife, my children, my friends, because this week it's been hard to love people. This is the week where you need a good dog, who you're like, you're always faithful, you know, and, and that, you know, and, they can, and you can ignore them or be mean, but they're always there, right? That's, it's easy to love that kind of thing. But when you have to love people the way God does, we recognize It's really hard because quite often we're not as connected to God as we think. And what this did this week to me was very disturbing. I realized I was detached from the Lord Jesus Christ of whom I preach. And it felt incredibly lame. And it doesn't quit feeling lame. And God began to prune things back because in my life, I quit loving people he died to save. I quit being kind and loving to, I think I was a bit of a jerk as a husband this week, as a father. I wasn't my best. The reality is, when we disconnect from the vine, the only way to know is to check for fruit. And when I stopped to look for love, I was like, oh man, there's a surprising absence of love. And then when I went for joy, I was too angry by that point to find joy, right? I was like, oh, where's all the joy? You know, I was mad, I was frustrated, and I was irritated, and it showed on my face because I did a fruit check. I looked to see, is there any love for God? And I could manufacture that, but when I had to prove it by having love for his people that comes out of me, it was absent. Do a fruit check. Do a fruit check. It's terrifying because what you find is a lot of fruitless connections in your life that God's saying, will you let me? cut those off. Will you let me trim in you that which doesn't honor me? Second application is this. Don't fear the pruning shears. If God is a good vine dresser and what he wants to do is bring his kingdom manifest through our lives, we we don't have to fear the pruning shears. Who here has ever pulled a child's tooth from their head? Anybody? Yeah, it's so fun, isn't it creepy? Like, let us collect your bones and put them under a pillow and a magic person will come take them. It's terrifying for children, I would think. But when we pull a tooth from a child, we wrap a string around their tooth, we tie it to a Leland's like crying, what? I don't even have teeth yet. Um, But we tie a string to their tooth and to a doorknob. And have you ever just, if you get the chance, watch the kid. They're like this. (sighs) They're like, they're watching what? That string the whole time, and you can see their pulse here, and they're just like, oh my word, oh my goodness, because they're terrified. They're about to have a bone plucked out of their head, and they don't know if they want it, but it's too wiggly to eat, and they're just like, oh, and you as a parent are going, it's fine, clack, oh, (laughs) you know, that's how it goes, but when you watch them, they're just watching the line, and they're terrified. See, our problem is we see these pruning shears coming at our life, and we're like, oh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Look away. Take a look at the gardener. Take a look at the gardener, not so much the implement or the tool in his hand. The gardener's work 
is purposeful, it's peaceful, and it's visionary. Have you ever thought about that? A vine dresser will clip these little nubs that are just growing a little off to the side, literally like a little nub. They'll clip it and they'll take another one and as soon as they can, they wrap that vine, that little nub as it grows around the trellis to grow it in a visionary direction. They want it to grow a certain way and it takes a cutting away. And if you look at the, at the shears, the pruning shears, we get very afraid. But if we look at the gardener, you begin to see the hope of God. You begin to see God coming up going, that's not fruitful anymore. So we're going to take that away and we're going to do this. There's a smile. There's a winsome hopefulness that says fruitful living is about to come. Do you trust God? Often we don't because we're fixated on what we're afraid of. So thank God the shears are close. You and I have been pruned. And I will tell you this, it's painful. Before second service, I, told, I asked Erica, I said, would you pray for me? I don't feel good about how I've been doing on this very topic. I'm struggling with it. I too get afraid of the pruning shears. It's not easy, but if I look at the gardener, I'm reminded to thank God when the pruning shears come close, because why? They're in the hands of one who loves me, of one who is for me, of one who has a vision for the daily life I'm living, of one who wants more for his kingdom to come through me. Don't be afraid of the pruning shears. And finally, stay on the vine. Staying on the vine is mission critical for the Christian. It is hard to stay on the vine when we don't know what's going on. Our impulse is to grow wild, just do it our way, but that never seems to work out. What if we stay on the vine? What if we stay attached to Jesus Christ? What if we know him in order that our lives make him known? What if we make ourselves at home in the Lord Jesus Christ and we make his word at home in us. What if we stay close? I think there's one way to diagnose this. Anytime you want to run from God, there's a natural cause for that running. It started in Genesis 3 with the fall of humanity. Adam and Eve ran, and they hid from God. They disconnected from life, and they hid. You and I have not invented a new tactic. We run and hide from God when God says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. My friends, if you're carrying heavy burdens and you feel like my life doesn't deserve to be attached to the vine, neither does mine. Nobody deserves it, but for some reason, the Lord Jesus Christ saw fit to give his life that you and I could be attached. So don't run away. If you have a problem with sin, he has a cure to begin the transformation. It won't be easy. There will be things pruned out, but we stay on the vine and we don't run, not because it's easy, but because we trust the vine dresser. We trust that there is a guide in our life who will grow us out in the direction he desires so that one day our lives will look kind of like those giant grape clusters up in the old Mission Peninsula in mid-August, when it's just heavy with fruit. And we can be thankful that God not only prepared a trellis that could hold all the fruit, he believed in a bare branch that would one day be fruitful for his kingdom. If you don't have a life that is producing the kingdom fruit of love and joy in the world around you, hope is not lost. Stay on the vine. There is one who will attend to exactly what you need, maybe not what you want, but exactly what you need to live the life you have dreamed of in Christ Jesus. Make yourself at home in him and his word at home in you. Pray with me. God, so often we don't know where to turn in our life. We find ourselves quite often, Lord, um, wondering what's next wondering what your plan is, and it's because we've lost connection with you and we've not followed faithfully our guide, so forgive us. But also, Lord, we grieve even when good things are pruned away because, Lord, we see a small picture. Our lives seem so in focus and myopic, so we ask, God, when you prune something that we love and take away some things that we want or thought we needed, may we find the refrain of the old hymn alive in us that it is well. It is well. Though Satan would buffet, though trials would come, it is well with our soul. And it is well not because we have done something, 
but because we have received something, and that is the blood of Christ, which has forgiven our sins, connected us to the eternal, infinite God in an intimate way that allows us to become the very hands and feet of the kingdom of Christ. Lord, would you help us to believe, to believe enough that we would stay close to you, even when we're ashamed, even when we're lost. May we, your people, be bound to you, even as you have bound yourself to us. We love you. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing, and as we do, it is one of the great hymns of the church. Go ahead and stand. You don't have to worry. Some people got nervous there. Go ahead and stand, um, and you know this. We don't sing a ton of hymns here, but if, um, if you get the opportunity during this song, just look at the words, and remember, God sees it bigger, and though the trials of life come and go, it is well because of what he did and who we are connected to. May the peace of Christ be yours as we sing. And we make the mistake of thinking it's up to us to grow the fruit of God. But it is not. It is not up to you and I. We have but one high calling in this life. To know him and to connect with him. Because our sin does not define us. Our past does not own us. If we are bound and connected to the one who bought us with his own blood. Your life is going to produce fruit if you will be connected to Jesus Christ. I have never walked through a vineyard, and I've walked through a lot of them. I've never walked through a vineyard and heard grapes talking about how big they're going to get. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do it today. Today's the day I grow. That'd be weird. That'd be a haunted vineyard. That'd be odd. And we Christians are like, I'm going to get this right. No, we're not. We're going to connect to the one who did. So today I want to invite you to be free from all that binds you and connect to the one who set you free. You are the people of God called according to his purposes for his pleasure. All he seeks is a connection with you in Christ. So if you don't know him, come to him, all you who are weary. And as you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In a world that knows far too much chaos, may the peace of Christ be yours as you go forward. My friends, the church must leave the building. You are dismissed. All right, I just need the hospitality people to listen to me. I had a child make sure to ask before he left the stage, he wants the pumpkin cookies back. I wash my hands of that request. All right, it's been passed along, my little friend. So...